Good morning. Hope everybody's having a good morning, having a good worship service. Um, I want to do things a little bit different this year for, for the Senior Sunday. Um, usually what we try to do is we get... I'll call your name and you walk up here and grab your Bible, we take a picture. We're going to streamline it this year. If I could have all of our seniors come up and sit right here, I'll, do, I'll have a little thing to say and then we'll hand out the Bibles and then we'll all just take a group picture of, of all of us all at once. So as they're, they're making their way up here, I'm going to go ahead and, I want to go ahead and say that we are all extremely proud of each and every one of you and all of your accomplishments. Uh, you'll probably be told this a lot. I'm going to say it again anyways. Graduation isn't just a finish line. It's also another starting line. It's a new beginning, a new chapter. And even though you may not feel any different, it's a transition from one place in life to another. And the moment that that transition takes place is when the diploma hits your hand. Um, it's actually a very similar situation when we receive the Holy Spirit. Uh, in 2 Corinthians, Paul says this, chapter 1, verse 21. Now it is God who makes both us and you stand firm in Christ. He anointed us, set his seal of ownership on us, and put his spirit in our hearts as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. So just like the diploma is a tiny piece of paper that has a big effect on the rest of your life, the Spirit also has a big effect on us. Uh, it has the power to mold us and shape us and help us to be everything that God called us to be. So this time I'm going to... I've got the Bibles right here. Paige, come all the way up here. <laughs> Don't don't go anywhere. Samantha? This is this feels too easy. William? And Justin wasn't able to make it today. Ike? And last but certainly not least, Kellen. All right, let's, let's get a picture. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Y'all get y'all go ahead and sit back where you were sitting. You can sit there if you want to. That's what I thought. All right. I believe that each and every one of you has the potential to change the world. But, unfortunately, so many people both in the church and out of the church waste their God-given potential for good on having things and doing stuff. You're not a human doing. You're not a human having. You are a human being. So take some time and just be. Listen for God's voice in the midst of all the other noise and chaos. It's a lot easier to hear from Him when we turn the volume down on our other devices. And when you hear from Him, you can understand how you can be everything that He has called you to be. I want to I read you some lyrics from a, a Matthew West song. He says, I woke up this morning, saw a world full of trouble now. Thought, how'd we ever get so far down? How's it ever going to turn around? So I turned my eyes to heaven, and I thought, God, why don't you do something? I couldn't bear the thought of people living in poverty, children sold into slavery. The thought disgusted me. So I shook my fist at heaven and said, God, why don't you do something? And in the song, God responds this way, and I, I just love it. He said, I did. I created you. That is powerful to me, and I, I hope it's powerful to you as well. Uh, sometimes God's plan for you is much bigger and better, much higher and loftier than your plan for you. Um, 
He has called us to be more than we ever thought we were capable of, more than we ever thought we could hope to accomplish. You might be the answer to someone's prayers. Or, like the song, you might be the answer to your own prayer. You might be the blessing God has been trying to send, but you weren't ready to be everything He called you to be. If not us, then who? If not now, then when? We've already tried doing nothing. And unsurprisingly, nothing happened. So let's be something different. If you want to make a difference, you got to be different. If you want to light up the darkness, then be a light. But no matter what you choose to be, be love. Philippians 2, verse 14 through 16 says this, Do everything without grumbling or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of life. There's so many New Testament authors that I could point to that tell us that we need to stand out. We need to be different. Uh, the verse we just read is a great example. Uh, Romans 12, 2, do not be conformed to those, this world, but be transformed. Uh, 1 Peter 1, 15 and 16, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. We're supposed to be different. In fact, that's what holy means. It means different. It means set apart. If staying the way you are was going to make a difference, it already would have. So how can we be different? Well, we have the power to be different because we're filled with the Spirit. What does it look like when we're filled with the Spirit? Well, I'm glad you asked. Galatians 5, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience. It's, it's hard for me to say anything but patience because of the song. Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its desires, its passions, with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Okay, so first off, let's talk about what this isn't before we talk about what it is. This isn't a list of things that you have to do or things that you have to have in order to go to heaven. This is the list of things that the Spirit is going to produce in you and in your life. This is the fruit the Spirit will try to produce in us. So when we nurture our relationship with God, we allow the Spirit to work, we naturally become more loving, more kind, more forgiving, etc. So th this, is a, this is a process of what happens we naturally, as a result of what God is doing in us and, and through us. Uh, John 15, Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. But apart from me, you can do nothing. So we, the branch, need to stay connected to the vine, Jesus, in order for us to grow fruit. By itself, the branch cannot grow fruit on its own power. Its job is not to worry about that. Its job is to stay connected to the vine. So if we stay close to Him, good fruit will come out of us. We'll find ourselves naturally reacting to situations with love, with kindness. Uh, we'll be more forgiving to our friends and family, more patient. Um, in other words, you ooze what you're filled with. <laughs> So if you're filled with the Spirit and the fruits thereof, then things like love and joy and peace, etc., are going to flow out of you naturally and into the lives of others. Now, we can look around the world right now and we see there's people that need all kinds of things. They need something different, and that has to come from us. So be filled with the Spirit so you can be different and truly make a difference in their lives. Um... This world can also be a very dark place, uh, and it gets darker by the day. The world loves darkness be because they've never known anything different, and they won't know anything different unless we show them. A single candle in a dark room can still be seen by the entire room. So you want to light up the darkness, then be light. Uh, 
In Acts chapter 16, uh, this is the, the, the chapter where Paul and Silas get thrown into jail. And this is, this is what happens when they're in jail. Uh, in verse 23, after they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. When he received these orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in stocks. Okay, this isn't like prison that we have today. This is a dungeon. This is one of the darkest, bleakest, most horrible places to be. There's nothing in here but pain and suffering. And Paul and Silas are put in the middle of the room and they've had their, put, their feet put in stocks, kind of like this, not exactly. Uh, and this is uncomfortable, yes, but this is more of a, a mental game than it is a, a physical torture. Uh, you can't really bend your knees, so you're not going to be able to get comfortable. You can't lay down because, as we just read, they were severely flogged. So they can't get comfortable. They really just have to sit there and try to find a way to pass the time. And that's actually what they did. Uh, verse 25, about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the other prisoners were listening to them. They're surrounded by darkness. These prisoners are in pain. They're suffering. They probably haven't eaten in a few days. But Paul and Silas are different, like we just talked about. They aren't moaning or wailing. They aren't blaming God for their imprisonment or the, the beating that they had. They're worshiping. They're praying. They're singing. How could they find light in that prison? It's simple. They brought it with them. Verse 26, suddenly there was a violent earthquake that the foundation of the prison was shaken. At once all the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. The next logical thing that makes sense in this story is that every prisoner in that prison is gone. I mean, if an earthquake happened that only affected the chains and doors of the prison, I'm taking that as a sign that God wants me to escape. Am I right? So, uh, the jailer woke up, verse 27, and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. The Romans would have done much worse to him once they found this out if the prisoners had escaped. Verse 28, But Paul shouted, Don't harm yourself. We're all here. Under normal circumstances, why would any prisoner choose to stay in prison if he had the chance to escape? But these aren't normal circumstances. Paul and Silas aren't normal prisoners. In the darkest place in the world, the prisoners saw the light and they were so captivated by it, they chose to stay in prison just to be around it. Verse 29, the jailer called for the lights and rushed in and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He brought them out and asked them, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? There's no other question that seems important to him. He goes straight to, how do I get what you guys have? They tried to beat it out of you. But you were able to have hope in this place. You were able to inspire others to hope in this place. I want that. I need that. What must I do to be saved? Verse 31, they replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your, your household. And then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all the others in his house. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds, and immediately he and all his household were baptized. Uh, the jailer brought them into his house and set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole household. Now, Paul and Silas were priority number one. They, they were told, guard these two very carefully. Don't let them out of your sight. So not only, not only does he let them go, but he, he brings them to his house. He washes their wounds. He eats with them. And because this jailer saw the light... His entire family also were brought into the presence of this hope and this light. This world's a dark place. It gets darker each and every day. Your friends and family need you to be a light. They need you to be a source of hope. Matthew 5.16, Let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Now, being different is good. 
being a light is good. Those are not the only two things that you can be. But no matter what you choose to be, whatever God calls you to be, be love. The biggest difference between Christianity and any other religion is love. Jesus says this in John 13, A new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. By this everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. They will know that we belong to Jesus based on how we love. So that tells me love has to be the compass in our lives. Every decision needs to be filtered through love. Uh, Paul talks about love in great detail in 1 Corinthians 13. Uh, we're going to read the first three verses of that chapter. If I, speak in the, if I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If the words I say, no matter how amazing or beautiful or anything like that they are, if they aren't filtered through love, it's just noise. It's meaningless. People are going to find out real quick that you only love the sound of your own voice. Verse 2, If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and I have faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I was the smartest man alive, if I could speak Greek and Hebrew and even Latin for good measure, I could translate the entire Bible and I could tell you exactly what Jesus meant when he said this. Or I can tell you exactly what Paul meant when he said that. If I could do all of that without love, it would be nothing. Or maybe, maybe I have the strongest faith in the world. Maybe my faith can move literal mountains out of my way. Hebrews 11.6 says, Without faith, it's impossible to please God. So faith is a big deal. But if my faith isn't expressing itself in love, then my faith is nothing. And then verse 3. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Let's say I'm a giving person. I share all of my possessions, my money, my food, my home. I'm constantly trying to help people in need. And let's not kid ourselves. This is a good thing. But Paul says that if you manage to somehow do all of this without love, you gain nothing. If there's any ulterior motive whatsoever other than love, it, maybe it's fame, maybe it's recognition, or some kind of a reward, then you gain nothing. We've been given very clear instructions to love. Mark 12, uh, they, they came to Jesus and they asked Him, what is the most important commandment? He says this, The most important one, answered Jesus, is this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. The second is this, Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these two. So if we try to do anything, if we try to be anything without these two things, even if it's right, even if it's good, it's still wrong. Let me put it this way. You can be different. You can stand out from everybody in the crowd. You can be the brightest light in the world. You can be everything God called you to be. But if it doesn't include love, if love isn't under everything and then over everything, it's still wrong. You can get everything else 100% right in the Bible, but without love, it will never truly be 100% right. So in conclusion, God has called us to be many things. And our God is a creative God. He's a God of variety. 
He may call one of us to be something. He may call another one to be something completely different. That's okay. We're all made differently. We're wired differently. We're all different parts of the same body of Christ. So we need to celebrate our differences. My weakness may be your strength. Your weakness may be so-and-so's strength. So let's use all of our gifts and work together. Be different. Be a light. And most importantly, be love. So today, if there's anything that any of us can do for you, anything at all, we ask that you please come as we stand and as we sing.